This is chapter 49. We took another swim in the Sea of Galilee at twilight yesterday, and another at sunrise this morning. We have not sailed, but three swims are equal to a sail, are they not? There were plenty of fish visible in the water, but we have no outside aids in this pilgrimage, but tent life in the Holy Land, the land in the book, and other literature of like description, no fishing tackle. There were no fish to be had in the village of Tiberias. True, we saw two or three vagabonds mending their nets, but never trying to catch anything with them. We did not go to the ancient warm baths two miles below Tiberias. I had no desire in the world to go there. It seemed a little strange and prompted me to dis try to discover what the cause of this unreasonable indifference was. It turned out to be simply because Pliny mentions them. I have conceived a sort of unwarrantable unfriendliness towards Pliny and St. Paul, because it seems as if I can never fare out a place that I can have to myself. It always and eternally transpires that St. Paul has been to that place, and Pliny has mentioned it. In the early morning we mounted and started, and then a weird apparition marched forth at the head of the procession. A pirate, I thought. If ever a pirate dwelt upon the land, it was a tall Arab as swarthy as an Indian. Young, say thirty years of age, on his head he had closely bound a gorgeous yellow and red striped silk scarf, whose ends, lavishly fringed with tassels, hung down between his shoulders and dallied with the wind. From his neck to his knees in ample folds a robe swept down that was a very star-spangled banner of curved and sinuous bars of black and white. Out of his back somewhere, apparently, the long stem of a chibuk projected and reached far above his right shoulder. Athwart his back diagonally and extended high above his left shoulder was an Arab gun of Saladin's time that was splendid with silver plating from stock to clear up to the end of its measureless stretch of barrel. About his waist was bound many and many a yard of elaborately figured but sadly tarnished stuff that came from sumptuous Persia. and among the baggy folds in front of the sunbeams glinted from formidable battery of old brass-mounted horse pistols and the gilded hilts of bloodthirsty knives. There were holsters for more pistols appended to the wonderful stack of long-haired goatskins and Persian carpets which the man had been taught to regard in the light of a saddle, and down among the pendulous rank of vast tassels that swung from the saddle, and clanging against the iron shovel of a stirrup that propelled the warrior's knees up towards his chin was a crooked silver-clad scimitar of such awful dimensions and such implacable expression that no man might hope to look upon it and not shudder. The fringed and bedizened prince whose privilege it is to ride the pony and lead the elephant into a country village as poor and naked compared to this chaos of paraphernalia, and the happy vanity of the one is the very poverty of satisfaction compared to the majestic serenity, the overwhelming complacency of the other. Who is this? What is this? That was the trembling inquiry all down the line. Our guard, from Galilee to the birthplace of the Savior, the country is infested with Bedouins, whose sole happiness it is in this life to cut and stab and mangle and murder unoffending Christians. Allah be with us. Then hire a regiment. Would you send us out among these desperate hordes with no salvation 
in our utmost need but this old turret? The dragoman laughed, not at the facetiousness of the simile, for verily that guide or that courier or that dragoman never yet lived upon earth who had in him the faintest appreciation of a joke. Even though that joke were so broad and so ponderous that if it fell on him it would flatten him out like a postage stamp. The dragoman laughed, and then, emboldened by some thought that was in his brain, no doubt, proceeded to extremities and winked. In straits like these, when a man laughs, it is encouraging when he winks. It is positively reassuring. He finally intimated that one guard would be sufficient to protect us, but that that one was an absolute necessity. It was because of the moral weight his awful penalty would have with the Bedouins. Then I said we didn't want any guard at all if one fantastic vagabond could protect eight armed Christians and a pack of Arab servants from all harm. Surely that detachment could protect themselves. He shook his head doubtfully. Then I said, just think of how it looks. Think of how it would read the self-reliant Americans that we went sneaking through this deserted wilderness under the protection of this masquerading Arab who would break his neck getting out of the country if a man that was a man ever started after him. It was a mean, low, degrading position. Why were we ever told to bring Navy revolvers with us if we had to be protected at last by this infamous star-spangled scum of the desert. The appeals were vain. The dragoman only smiled and shook his head. I rode to the front and struck up an acquaintance with King Solomon in all his glory and got him to show me his lingering eternity of a gun. It had a rusty flint lock. It was ringed and barred and plated with silver from end to end, but it was a desperately out of the perpendicular, as are all the billiard cubes of 49 that one finds yet in service in the ancient mining camps of California. The muzzle was eaten by the rust of centuries into a ragged filigree work, like the end of a burnt-out stove pipe. I shut one eye and peered within. It was flaked with iron rust like an old steamboat boiler. I borrowed the ponderous pistols and snapped them. They were rusty inside, too. Had not been loaded for a generation. I went back, full of encouragement, and reported to the guide and asked him to discharge the dismantled fortress. It came out then that this fellow was a retainer of the Sheik of Tiberius. He was a source of government revenue. He was to the Empire of Tiberius what the customs are to America. The Sheik imposed guards upon travelers and charged them for it. It is a lucrative source of emolument and sometimes brings into the national treasury as much as thirty-five or forty dollars a year. I knew the warrior's secret now, I knew the hollow vanity of his rusty trumpery, and despised his asinine complacency. I told on him, and with reckless daring the cavalcade straight ahead into the perilous solitudes of the desert, and scorned his frantic warnings of the mutilation and death that hovered about them on every side. Arrived at an elevation of 1,200 feet above the lake. I ought to mention that the lake lies 600 feet below the level of the Mediterranean. No traveler ever neglects to flourish that fragment of news in his letters. As bald and unthrilling a panorama as any land can afford, perhaps, was spread out before us. Yet it was so crowded with historical interest that if 
all the pages that had been written about it were spread upon its surface, they would flag it from horizon to horizon like a pavement. Among the localities comprised in this view were Mount Hermon, the hills that border Caesarea Philippe, Dan, the sources of the Jordan, the waters of Merman, Tiberius, the Sea of Galilee, Joseph's Pit, Capernaum, Bethsaida, the supposed scene of the Sermon on the Mount, the feeding of the multitudes, and the miraculous draught of fishes, the declivity down which the swine ran to the sea, the entrance and the exit of the Jordan, Safid, the city set upon a hill, one of the four holy cities of the Jews, and the place where they believe the real Messiah will appear when he comes to redeem the world. Part of the battlefield of Hayton, where the knightly crusaders fought their last fight, and in a blaze of glory passed from the stage and ended their splendid career forever. Mount Tabor, the traditional scene of the Lord's transfiguration, and down towards the southeast lay a landscape that suggested to my mind a quotation, imperfectly remembered, no doubt. The Ephraimites, not being called upon to share in the rich spoils of the Ammonitish war, assembled a mighty host to fight against Jephthah, judge of Israel, who, being appraised of their approach, gathered together the men of Israel, and gave them battle, and put them to flight. To make this victory the more secure, he stationed guards at the different fords and passages of the Jordan, with instructions to let none pass, who could not say shibboleth. The Ephraimites, being of a different tribe, could not frame to pronounce the word right, but called it sibboleth, which proved them enemies and cost them their lives. Wherefore, forty and two thousand fell at the different fords and passages of the Jordan that day. We jogged along peacefully over the great caravan route from Damascus to Jerusalem and Egypt, past Lubia and other Syrian hamlets, perched in the unvarying style upon the summit of steep mounds and hills, and fenced round about with giant cactuses, the sign of worthless land, with prickly pears upon them like hams, and came at last to the battlefield of Hatton. It is a grand, irregular plateau, and looks as if it might have been created for a battlefield. Here the peerless Saladin met the Christian host some seven hundred years ago, and broke their power in Palestine for all time to come. There had long been a truce between the opposing forces, but according to the guidebook, Reynald of Chatillon, Lord of Carrock, broke it by plundering a Damascus caravan and refusing to give up either the merchants or their goods when Saladin demanded them. This conduct of an insolent petty chieftain stung the sultan to the quick, and he swore that he would slaughter Reynolf with his own hand no matter how or when or where he found him. Both armies prepared for war under the weak king of Jerusalem was the very flower of the Christian chivalry. He foolishly compelled them to undergo a long, exhausting march in the scorching sun, and then, without water or other refreshments, ordered them to encamp in this open plain. The splendid mounted masses of Muslim soldiers swept around the north end of Genesaret, burning and destroying as they came and pitched their camp in front of the opposing lines. At dawn, the terrific fight began, surrounded on all sides by the sultan's swarming battalions. The Christian knights fought on without a hope for their lives. They fought with desperate valor, but to no purpose. The odds of heat and numbers and consuming thirst were too great against them. Towards the middle of the day, the bravest of their band cut their way through the Muslim ranks and gained the summit of a little hill, and there, hour 
After hour they closed around the banner of the cross and beat back the charging squadrons of the enemy. But the doom of the Christian power was sealed. Sunset found Saladin lord of Palestine, the Christian chivalry strewn in heaps upon the field, and the king of Jerusalem, the grand master of the Templars, and Reynald of Chatillon, captives in the Sultan's tent. Saladin treated two of the prisoners with princely courtesy, and ordered refreshments to be set before them. When the king handed a nice sherbet to Chatillon, the Sultan said, It is thou that givest it to him, not I. He remembered his oath, and slaughtered the hapless knight of Chatillon with his own hand. It was hard to realize that this silent plain had once resounded with martial music and trembled to the tramp of armed men. It was hard to people this solitude with rushing columns of cavalry and stir its torpid pulses with the shouts of victors and the shrieks of the wounded and the flash of banner and steel above the surging billows of war. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We reached Tabor safely and considerably in advance of that old ironclad swindle of a guard. We never saw a human being on the whole route, much less lawless hordes of Bedouin. Tabor stands solitary and alone, a giant sentinel above the plain of Esdrelion. It rises some fourteen hundred feet above the surrounding level. A green wooden cone, symmetrical and full of grace, a prominent landmark, and one that is exceedingly pleasant to eyes surfeited with the repulsive monotony of desert Syria. We climb the steep path to its summit through breezy glades of thorn and oak. The view presented from its highest peak was almost beautiful. Below was the broad, level plain of Estralian, checkered with fields like a chessboard, and full of smooth and level, seemingly dotted with about its borders with white, compact villages, and faintly penciled far and near with curving lines of roads and trails. When it is robed in the fresh verdure of spring, it must form a charming picture, even by itself. Skirting its southern border rises Little Hermon, over whose summit a glimpse of Gilboa is caught. Nine, famous for raising of the widow's son, and Endor is famous for the performances of her witch are in view. To the eastward lies the valley of the Jordan, beyond it is the mountains of Gilead. Westward is Mount Carmel, Hermon is in the north. The tablelands of Bashan, Safed, and the holy city gleaming white upon a tall spur of the mountains of Lebanon. A steel blue corner of the Sea of Galilee, Saddle Peak Hatton, traditional Mount of Beatitudes, and mute witness brave fights of the crusading host for Holy Cross. These fill up the picture. To glance at the salient features of this landscape through the picturesque framework of a ragged and ruined stone window, arch of the time of Christ, thus hiding from sight all that is unattractive, is to secure yourself a pleasure worth climbing the mountain to enjoy. One must stand on his head to get the best effect in a fine sunset and set a landscape in a bold, strong framework that is very close at hand, to bring out all its beauty. One learns this latter truth never more to forget it in that mimic land of enchantment, the wonderful garden of my lord, the Count Palavincia, near Genoa. 
You go wandering for hours among the hills and wooded glens, artfully contrived to leave the impression that nature shaped them and not man, following winding paths and coming suddenly upon leaping cascades and rustic bridges, finding sylvan lakes where you expected them not, loitering through battered medieval castles in miniature that seem hoary with age and yet were built a dozen years ago, meditating over ancient crumbling tombs whose marble columns were marred and broken purposely by the modern artists that made them, stumbling unawares upon toy palaces wrought of rare and costly materials, and again upon a peasant's hut whose dilapidated furniture would never suggest that it was made so to order, sweeping round and round in the midst of a forest on an enchanted wooden horse that is moved by some invisible agency, traversing Roman roads and passing under majestic triumphal arches, resting in quaint bowers where unseen spirits discharge jets of water on you from every possible direction, and where even the flowers you touch assail you with a shower, boating on a subterranean lake among caverns and arches, royally draped with clustering stalactites and passing out into open day upon another lake which is bordered with sloping banks of grass and gay with patrician barges that swim at anchor in the shadows of a miniature marble temple that rises out of the clear water and glasses its white statues. Its rich capitals and fluted columns in the tranquil depths so, from marvel to marvel, you have drifted on, thinking all the time that the one last scene must be the chiefest, and verily the chiefest wonder is reserved until the last, but you do not see it until you step ashore, and passing through a wilderness of rare flowers, collected from every corner of the earth, you stand at the door of one more mimic temple. Right in this place the artist taxed his genius to the utmost, and fairly opened the gates of fairyland. You look through an unpretending pane of glass, stained yellow. The first thing you see is a mass of quivering foliage, ten short steps before you, in the midst of which is a ragged opening like a gateway, a thing that is common enough in nature, and not apt to excite suspicions of a deep human design, and above the bottom of the gateway project, in the most careless way, a few broad tropic leaves and brilliant flowers. All of a sudden, through the bright, bold gateway, you catch a glimpse of the faintest, softest, richest picture that ever graced the dream of a dying saint. Since John saw the New Jerusalem, glimmering above the clouds of heaven, a broad sweep of sea, flecked with careening sails and sharp jutting cape, and a lofty lighthouse on it, the sloping lawn behind it, beyond a portion of the old city of palaces with its parks and hills and stately mansions, beyond these a prodigious mountain with its strong outlines sharply cut against ocean and sky, and over all, vagrant shreds and flakes of cloud floating in a sea of gold. The ocean is gold, the city is gold, the meadow and the mountain and the sky, everything is gold and rich and mellow and dreamy as a vision of paradise. No artist could put upon canvas its entrancing beauty, and yet... Without the yellow glass and the carefully contrived accident of a framework that cast it into an enchanted distance and shut out from it all unattractive features, it was not a picture to fall into ecstasies over. Such is life, and the trail of the serpent is over us all. There is nothing for it now but to come back to old Tabor, though the subject is tiresome enough, and I cannot stick to it for wandering off 
to scenes that are pleasanter to remember. I think I will skip anyhow. There is nothing about Tabor except we can see that it was the scene of the transfiguration. But some gray old ruins stacked up there in all the ages of the world from the days of the stout Gideon and parties that flourished thirty centuries ago in the fresh yesterday of crusading times. It has the Greek convent and the coffee there is good but never a splinter of the true cross or bone of a hollowed saint to arrest the idle thoughts of worldlings and turn them into graver channels. A Catholic church is nothing to me that has no relics. The plain of Australia and the battlefield of the nations only sets one to dreaming of Joshua and Ben Haddad and Saul and Gideon, Tamerlane, Tancred, Coeur de Leon and Saladin, the warrior kings of Persia, Egypt's heroes and Napoleon, for they all fought here. If the magic of the moonlight could summon from the graves of forgotten centuries and many lands the countless myriads that have battled on this wide, far-reaching floor and array them in the thousand strange costumes of their hundred nationalities and send the vast host sweeping down the plain, splendid with plumes and banners and glittering lances. I could stay here an age and see the phantom pageant, but the magic of the moonlight is a vanity and a fraud, and whoso putteth his trust in it shall suffer sorrow and disappointment. Down at the foot of Tabor and just at the edge of the storied plain of Estrellion is the insignificant village of Deborea, where Deborah, prophetess of Israel, lived. It is just like Magdala. <laughs>